Hi all, I have an absolutely amazing game to show you of Leela Chess today. This is against the mighty Stockfish. This is in the Chesscom Blitz Battle, five minutes with a two second increment, stage three. Let's have a look. e4, d6, Piet's defense, d4, knight f6, knight c3, g6. So Leela plays bishop e3 now, bishop g7, queen d2. So very aggressive and direct. This battery aims later to exchange off this dark square bishop defender, leaving black potentially vulnerable on these dark squares. Black commits to castling kingside here. Now, if knight g4 instead, the bishop can go to g5, and it's no problem. The knight's kicked back, and business as usual, white has a small edge. So black didn't bother with knight g4, but now knight g4 is actually prevented anyway with f3. We have c6 in chess based live book here. e5 is quite a common move, and this continuation is a small advantage for white, small edge. But you'll note that white has committed to castling queenside here. This is very, very popular. This is like mainstream continuation. In the game with c6, in fact, Leela decides to leave her king in the center and plays bishop h6. Uh, more standard is casting queenside actually committing the king to c1 and for example this position uh, is thought to be a small advantage for white but not winning or anything just yet. However, so very interesting, leaving the king in the center of bishop h6 immediately. c5, d5, we have knight bd7. Bishop e2 Stockfish takes on h6, queen takes, and now the annoying queen b6. This queen is actually going to be pretty annoying soon in this game, across this diagonal, in fact, as we're about to bear witness. Leela commits a rook, actually forfeiting castling rights for casting queenside. On casting queenside, there's a nifty idea of just playing queen a5 just to unblock the b pawn. And this should give some aggressive counterplay, even if black sacks a pawn. It's worth it with the king on c1 here. And then we've got a double-edged game. Uh, so, But actually, the way Leela plays it, it's more like a one-edged game at the moment because the king might actually be safer here, whilst the opposing king is a real fixed target on g8. And this looks kind of ominous intuitively that the rook is here, ready to blast through a pawn uh, to open up this rook. And wouldn't that have implications for king safety, just from a visual kind of perspective? Uh, knight e5, g4, or what we might identify as, in inverted commas, common sense. This looks pretty dangerous, doesn't it? How does black actually get to the white king here in this position? Well, we have c4, which seems aggressive enough, at least opening up the queen on this diagonal uh, to be a nuisance. Knight h3. So we have now queen c5, which gets out of the way of the b pawn. Stockfish wants to push this knight away from the center and do stuff after that. Rook g1, b5. But what is the leader up to with this rook g1, rook g3? It seems. This is a really nifty configuration. The knight uh, has blocked the h pawn, but the rook is going this way to the h file via knight g5 and rook h3, amusingly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this this is quite interesting in its own right. Uh, h4 was, was deemed less effective, and there might be some naughty tactics here on h4 involving this queen on the diagonal in any case if you'll note things like bishop takes g4 for example uh and knights hitting f2 coordinating with the queen so whatever the reason but knight h3 this was deemed the way to do it to get the rook round here so rook g3 knight ed7 the knight actually retreats its claws uh so there's less pressure on g4 less pressure on f3 we have knight g5 very aggressive knight, difficult to dislodge either the queen or knight. But slight downside, it does interrupt 
this diagonal and Stockfish pounces on the E three square. Is this a total pain, royal pain here? This queen on E three. It's kicked, but it goes to F four. So knight F two, and the queen goes back to E three. Rook D one, and this stops at least the queen going to D four. But also this rook might actually play a role later. If ever black wants to play e5, you'll note that this rook is activated via en passant, hitting a target on d6. Bear note to that. We have b4. Now knight f h3 with the idea of playing f4 to kick the queen at least. But also the f pawn itself could be a battering ram with f5 to weaken this pawn structure here around the black king c3 so we have f4 kicking the queen now out of the e3 square and this rook obviously stops the, the queen going to d4 so the queen goes out to b6 back knight f2 is played now and it's getting a bit critical black played rook e8 stop his play rook e8 just to show how critical if c takes this is asking for trouble with rook h3 this is just the total disaster. It's just uh, <laughs> it's absolutely disastrous if black has to do stuff like this. Yeah. So um, we have rook e8 making way for another defensive knight to try and hold the structure together. f5. You might think rook h3 was interesting as well. It is, but f f5 seems actually quite significantly stronger on rook h3 knight f8 this position uh, is is very different it's a very different scenario uh, black might actually have some defensive resources but even here even here technically white's doing very well but anyway f5 without committing the rook knight f8 and now b3 locks down the queen side, side counterplay and with the rook not on h3, it makes way for another battering ram, basically, maximizing, if there's any lesson here, Lila is maximizing the battering rams of the f and h pawns to smash through to, you know, on g6, to smash through this g6 structure. So bishop a6, h4, we have bishop takes. On rook a c8 as an example, what does border point actually do? Well, here's a scenario with h5, hg, and the knight can go into e6 potentially. You'll note that this knight's not just defending h7, but also defending against knight e6. But now with rook f3, fg and rook f takes c6 is dangerous. For example, like this, or switching here is crushing. But if we look at this again, hold on a sec after rook f3. Uh, there's also, if we look at fg6, knight e6, this is also uh, this is also a very big advantage, absolutely crushing. There are a lot of ways of getting a big advantage here all of a sudden. Uh, so bishop takes e2 was played. And now, yeah, this is not what black wants to play at all. But Stockfish basically, in a way, concedes that a huge loss of material with e5. Because as previously mentioned, any unpassant is activating the rook on d6. But this is a really, really violent attempt to try and get a second rank defense going with the queen, basically. Try and get this pawn out of the way for that queen to help. Uh, if we look instead at rook a b8, h5, this, the battering rams do their work. And after knight takes, knight e6 is crushing. If that knight ever leaves the f8 square, it's stopping, uh, which was stopping knight e6. Now, threatening checkmate shows some of the dangers lurking behind the scenes here, just getting mated. If we look at this again, let's have a look at this again. This variation, if h takes g6, then rook h1, this one is actually the best uh, to do the job. Threatening queen h8, checkmate. This is gory stuff. Uh, if knight h7, then well, just knight e6, actually. And what, if black has to sacrifice the queen, that's not very good news. Uh, but amusingly, this is just for amusement, by the way. Uh, in fact, uh, here, 
this rook, if this rook is used, uh, there's an unfortunate tactic which maybe would we'd be gutted to have missed in an over the board game. But even here, white doesn't have to take and go in for this fork trick. White is actually still better even after queen takes f2 uh, in this position with king d3, believe it or not. Black really hasn't got that many attacking pieces. So maybe there's a lesson of don't panic there if uh, something bad happens in your attack. Because how does black actually do anything here? There's still a number of issues to resolve. Um, for example, knight h5, this position, if this is the best, it's still great for white. Still winning for white, this position. The exchange up, crushing attack still. So yeah, it's it's pretty brilliant position. So for e5 to have to be played is a desperate looking defense. D takes, f takes, f takes g. And now queen c7, yeah, the queen's having to take full priority to defend. If h takes g instead, then rook f3, in fact, stripping open that f file, attacking one of the key defensive knights. Uh, so, for example, here, if this h5, and it's tearing through this position, this is actually just a winning endgame, actually, this scenario, in any case. So, uh, queen c7, rook f3, and again, we get a transition now. The queen is left the defense, by the way, of d6 here by doing this. So Leela just cashes out into a great ending. Now the big threat is rook takes f6 and queening. So this pawn has to be taken. Uh, so knight takes and now rook takes d6. This is just brilliant because you'll note that there's two connected past pawns here for Leela to use. And she is very good with the past pawns. g5 here and now... A couple of rooks come off, but knight d3 hitting b4. Stockfish is in such a state, a miserable state, doesn't even bother protecting this pawn. Uh, for example, here, this is just crushing anyway. This kind of scenario is absolutely brilliant with the knight centralized, stopping any use of e5 from black. This is just absolutely crushing. So uh, we have this pawn just left to be taken with rook e8, and quite amusingly, uh, Leader is just snapping up stockfish pawns here, one by one. Another one goes, another one bites the dust, as Queen says. And okay, h4 is lost, but there's three connected past pawns now over here. Lovely jubblies. Knight g6, rook c5, knight f8, king e3. So can Leader win this endgame? She wins this endgame in a super confident style, assisted by table based understanding giving up a4 this position kind of understanding it's a winning position from a table based perspective pretty soon and she can sacrifice back some material just to simplify things and still remain within winning table based territory so the job's really been done here but it's pretty amusing stuff what we're about to see in any case i assure you so check and we have rook d6 so that rook's given up out of total desperation. It's a totally lost position. So does Leela troll to try and lose all her pieces apart from one knight and pawn? She wouldn't do anything that outrageous, would she? I mean, seriously, does she have to? Okay, that was a, that was technically a fork anyway. So that's that's understandable, a casualty to lose the rook there. She's four pawns up. Yeah. So now what happens? Well, one of the pawns is given up. And in fact, another pawn. It's given up. <laughs> and this is still a table based win. A win is a win is a win. And the purists I don't know why they don't find this fun and entertaining. Giving the pawns pawns up to reach a totally table based winning position. Even this position, even with the might of stockfish, just one pawn here in this night ending. This is very instructive. Is absolutely winning. King g8, c5. Leader is desperate to give up that last pawn just to say, look, I just need one extra pawn. Because in this particular configuration, the knight is not going to gobble this pawn to leave white with the only knight. It just happens to be a position. Believe it or not, even here, black has zero chance. Black played king e6 in this position. Uh, if we look at king e8, then knight f4, and there's knight g6. And if 
uh, for example, knight g8, then there's the beautiful, or there's, there's actually two moves. You can even play knight h8 check and then win that knight, totally winning. So even just with one pawn here in this knight ending, Leela understands, thankfully, this is a great contrast from previous tournaments where she ended up with the extra material and drawing. She understands just with this one extra pawn that this is a totally one position. Now after knight g6, forcing that queening square, the pawn for the queening square. So now the pawn triumphantly uh, queens and let's have a look at the amazing technique now shown so against the mighty stockfish which in many tournaments recently has not suffered too many uh, losses overall so any any losses of of stockfish are kind of new newsworthy almost so this amazing technique yeah the knight's picked up now and there's not too much to go now check mate so Leela shows a few things here not committing her king to castling queenside it seems sometimes it might be safer on e1 the king than c1 if it's proven against stockfish that's pretty strong evidence that it actually worked quite well to leave the king in the center that breaks some of our conceptions of the game in king safety leaving the king in the center like that but with such a ferocious attacking grip and two battering rams available in the form of the f and h pawns how exactly was black meant to defend that position and this very crafty rook crawling behind you know rook g1 rook g3 instead of the more standard looking h4 attempts so very very crafty looking moves uh, there by leela to expose the king safety aspects of black's king there if you enjoyed this game immensely like i did <laughs> then please click on the top left box which should appear shortly to become a member at chessworld.net and you can see the analysis of this on the improved menu learn from the masters youtube order and any analysis updates i do to this fantastic game you can check those out as well also you can be invited to tournaments with other youtubers etc so if you use that link uh okay comments questions donations see the description for that link likes shares subscribes uh, with the notification bell all appreciated thanks very much